Hey everybody, welcome to worship with Our Savior Lutheran Church in Thomaston, a congregation of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. My name is Pastor Rachel Anderson and I am just so excited. I'm so excited for today, especially today, October 11th, 2020, this auspicious occasion when after nearly seven months of worshiping online and worshiping out in the park, we are finally back in our sanctuary today, right here at 505 South Main Street in Thomaston. I am really excited. Things look kind of different and they feel kind of different. So just know that everything that we're doing, we are doing to try to keep you and me and all of us safe. We're going to continue doing this for as long as we need to, um, but I'm still really excited about it. I'm still looking forward to worshiping with you right here at 1015. Now, that being said, we are still going to continue to worship together online. So please feel free, feel comfortable to continue participating in the life of this congregation, this community online. It's as valid a way to participate in community as in-person services are. We learned that together over these last seven months. So I hope you'll feel comfortable participating however you can, but please participate. We want to hear from you. So reach out to us. Let us know what your needs are, what we can do for you, how we can best serve you during these weird, wacky times. But if you're available on Sunday mornings, if you feel comfortable on Sunday mornings, please come and join us right here at Our Savior at 1015. We so look forward to seeing you. Now, let's pray. Lord of the feast, you have prepared a table before all peoples and poured out your life with abundance. Call us again to your banquet. Strengthen us by what is honorable, just, and pure, and transform us into a people of righteousness and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord, according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. So let's talk about the parable of the wedding banquet that you just heard. Now the parable from last Sunday immediately precedes the parable for today. And like last week's text, this text has historically been interpreted as approving of or condoning violence against the Jewish people. But in scripture, as with all things, everything is contextual. And if the love and grace and mercy of God, and if the Jewishness of Jesus isn't enough to convince us that we shouldn't hurt our neighbors because they have different beliefs than we do, then the context of this text should convince us that it's not intended as an anti-Semitic text, and in fact, anti-Semitism is violence and it is sin. So, what is the context? Well, the author of Matthew is probably writing sometime after 70 CE, 70 Common Era. And he's writing most likely in Antioch in Syria, which means his audience were subjects of the Roman Empire. And from the clues that we can piece together about the author, he was learned, probably a Jewish scribe, and his audience were either Jewish, most likely they were Jewish, or they at least had a very good understanding of Torah. Now, that date, 70 CE, is so vitally important because that's when the siege of Jerusalem began. After months and years of the Jewish people in Jerusalem protesting peacefully and violently, <coughs> over their unfair treatment by the Roman Empire, the emperor decides he's had enough, and he sends troops to lay siege to Jerusalem just three days before Passover. At this point in time, the city was full of people who were in town visiting family and friends, men, women, children, 
infants. And over the course of the next five months, the Romans laid waste to this city. They killed an estimated 30,000 people, not to mention the people of that city who starved or died of disease. And ultimately, to add, <clears throat> to some extent, to add insult to injury, the Romans then destroyed the temple, the great temple in Jerusalem. Most scholars agree that that's the event that Matthew is alluding to in the first half of the parable, <clears throat> where the invited guests refuse to show up to the king's son's wedding <laughs> after ignoring and beating and killing the slaves who are stand-ins for the prophets and the apostles in the early Christian church. <clears throat> and so he sends his troops to wipe the invited guests off the face of the earth. Matthew's audience would have been familiar with the siege of Jerusalem. They would have lived in fear of Rome doing to Antioch what Rome did to Jerusalem. But Matthew isn't even sad about it. He isn't sad that Jerusalem got sacked. He isn't sad that the temple was destroyed. The parable and the way that Matthew talks about Pharisees throughout this particular text, as a Jewish scribe, Matthew figured that the violence and destruction the Pharisees and all of the people of Jerusalem experienced was God's divine retribution for the ways people in positions of power in that city had disobeyed God's law and rejected God's grace in the person of Jesus. So it's likely that the original intent of this parable was that Matthew's Jewish audience would make the connection between the invited guests and the powerful religious and political figures from Jerusalem, which at that point was destroyed. Not that they would point the finger at them and say, what happened to you is your fault because you're Jewish, but that they would recognize themselves in this story, that they would hear the warning to not trust the comfort that Rome offers you, to not ignore your neighbors, the people Jesus advocated for, the hungry, the poor, and the sick, the way that the Pharisees in Jerusalem ignored them, because their sin, their disobedience to God, it eventually caught up with them. Jesus called out the wealthy and powerful and religious authorities who flouted God's word, God's law, God's love. And he preached about upending the sinful social structures that were common. It was everything in Jerusalem, and it was everything throughout the Roman Empire. And he said the prostitutes and the poor and the sick and beggars and women and children, these people at the bottom of the social pyramid matter to God. And if they don't matter to you, then God doesn't really matter to you either. This is a parable about how wealth and power and comfort corrupt us. How we experience these things at the expense of our neighbor. If I'm comfortable, then who is uncomfortable? And how the only way to avoid the violence that goes along with wealth and power and comfort is to work 
for the revelation of the kingdom of God, where everyone matters, where love and grace and mercy abound. So that's the first half of the parable. In the second half, the king tells his slaves to start dragging people into the wedding banquet from off the streets. But then the king gets absurdly, wildly violent all over again, this time because one of those poor souls who got dragged into his palace isn't dressed right. Well, of course he isn't dressed right. He's just minding his own business when somebody started shouting, hey, there's free food in here. So the king had this guy bound hand and foot and thrown into the outer darkness where the text says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Doesn't sound like a place you want to be. And the whole thing, in fact, sounds pretty outrageous, doesn't it? It sounds absurd. And it's supposed to sound absurd because it's an allegory. It's an allegory for the violent and destructive relationship between Jerusalem and Rome and the early church and for the followers of Jesus to not be so smug in their newfound faith. The destruction of Jerusalem? That could be you too, pal, if you cozy up to strong men and emperors, if you believe that kings and princes and governors and priests and politicians are going to save you. If you reject and ignore the people around you begging for you to see them and to help them. If you want to experience the kingdom, you have got to be prepared to make it happen. Everybody's welcome to show up at the table everybody gets fed but if you aren't dressed to get to work for the kingdom you aren't following jesus many are called but few are chosen we all feel the ache in our hearts we all know that the way that the world is is totally wrong. We know our neighbors shouldn't be out there right now worried about how they're going to feed their kids. Each and every single one of us is called to feed those people and not just feed them, but ask the powerful, ask people in positions of power why are these people hungry in the first place? Each of us is called to drive a spoke into the wheel of injustice. We are called to cut this off at the head. We know our neighbors deserve to have life and to have it in abundance but we feel powerless to do anything to change the way that things are. And we get comfortable. We get comfortable with the way things are. So we don't speak up. We don't say anything about how wrong it is. So stop feeling powerless. Stop being comfortable. Show up. But don't just show up. Show up ready to do justice. Prepared to be the hands and feet of Jesus in and for the sake of the world. Jesus advocated for the hungry, the sick, the homeless. He said women and children, prostitutes and tax collectors, Samaritans and polytheists, all of these people are beloved children of God. And their voices deserve to be heard too. But the powerful couldn't bear to have their power challenged. So they killed him. 
And every time we choose our own comfort over our neighbor's well-being, we crucify Christ all over again. That is the uncomfortable truth of this parable. If you want to experience the kingdom, you have got to do more than pay lip service to Jesus. That's the truth. You have been called. But more than that, you have been chosen. You show up. You show up to the table, hungry, ready to eat. But you need to be dressed the part too. Ready to sacrifice your comfort. Ready to feed your neighbor. Ready to love and serve and obey God by loving and serving your neighbor in need. Amen. Let us pray. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious host, fill your church with a spirit of joyous hospitality. We pray for bishops, teachers, church leaders, and all children of God as they invite others to your table of boundless grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as creation waits with eager longing for redemption, protect your creatures that are mistreated. Restore valleys, mountains, and pastures, and still and running waters. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as you set a table in the presence of enemies, so bless the efforts of diplomats, 
international peace workers, and world leaders who navigate conflict. May they proceed with dialogue and understanding so that justice and peace prevail. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, let your gentleness be known among those who are weary or ill. Strengthen doctors, medical care workers, and caretakers who see to their needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, we are quick to judge outward appearance. Remind us how you clothe all in your mercy. We pray for ministries that provide needed clothing and other personal care assistance in this community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as we remember those who have died and are gathered at the heavenly banquet, comfort us with your presence. Assure us of your peace at all times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, you are invited to make your offering to God. Although we can't be together in person, the work of the body of Christ continues. This work includes feeding our neighbors, binding up the brokenhearted, modeling justice, mercy, and grace. Thank you for your support of this vital, life-giving work. And let us pray. Merciful God, our ordinary gifts seem small for such a celebration, but you make of them in abundance, just as you do with our lives. Strengthen us for service in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Whether online or in the sanctuary, thank you so much for worshiping with us here at Our Savior Lutheran Church in Thomaston. It is a blessing to be with you each and every single Sunday. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and keep you now and always. Amen. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God.